Today, I am talking about children's stories, talking about children's stories. And I want to start off by telling a little story, not of my own, but I will start with a story that is not a children's story. I, I reference that I have a very large tome in front of me, the collected reviews of John Simon, a thing people casually carry around with them. Does, any, does anyone know who John Simon is? Uh, hung out with Garfunkel. Yes, yeah, Simon and Garfunkel, they were, they were very close with each other. Uh, that is not correct. Um, John Simon was a famous movie critic who wrote for, I believe, New York Magazine for something like 40 or 50 years. I, I will read this description from his obituary in the New York Times. He died in uh, 2019. This is the... It's hard to get news of someone new that I've never met, and you're like, also, he's and their dead. dead. I, Sorry. I just yeah, learned I know, of him, yeah. and then just learned of well, him. Yeah, I, but you also are going to hate him promptly, so don't don't worry too much. <laughs> this is a I very emotional podcast. For our podcast. Like, most of the people we talk about aren't really kicking around anymore. That's actually but, a good point. That's the whole yeah. classical part of it, right? Yeah. Um, but if anyone wants to be so swept up by emotion that you burst into tears, that is an acceptable response to any word that I say over the course of this day. Thank you. New York Times description. John Simon is one of the nation's most erudite, vitriolic, and vilified culture critics who illuminated and savaged a remarkable range of plays, films, literature, and artworks and their creators for more than a half century. Sorry, I mean, I just got, got the table all set up. I'm just like out of breath. I feel like I've been running all morning. Man, okay, sorry. Um, he was a film critic. He was notorious for his negative reviews. If, if you can think of any major film from 1970, uh, I think he started in 68, but from 1970 until 2010, if there is a major film that came out during that time, of which there are many, you can find a, a like the New York Times said, a vitriolic, a tearing apart review of that movie from uh, John Simon. This his uh, negative reviews uh, brought him into conflict with a certain other set of critics who were popular during this time, who, who you all have most likely heard of, a, a, a duo of Chicago-based movie critics. Does anyone know who those are? Ebert. Yeah, Ebert, Ebert's the big one, and Gene Siskel. So uh, Siskel and Ebert uh, had many, many words to say of John Simon. None of them were positive. This is Ro Roger Ebert writing in his memoir, uh, which I believe he wrote later in life. I feel repugnance for the critic John Simon, who made it a specialty to attack the way actors look. They can't help how they look any more than John Simon can help looking like a rat. <laughs> That's Roger Ebert, who normally I think is kind of a you know, teddy bear fun character, but has some very biting remarks at times. So this conflict uh, was, I think, best exemplified in 19, 1983 is when the conversation happened, but they're talking about this movie that came out in 1980 and we're gonna see if we can do another guess from the audience. 1980, an important sequel came out that would launch IP films for the next 40 years. What was that movie? Empire Strikes Back. The Empire Strikes yes, Back it. came out in May 1980. Uh, Point Donaldson? Oh yeah. What do you want? Eat uh, it, Hanenberg. Okay. <laughs> I was gonna say Predator 2. But am I talking about Predator I'm gonna be honest with you, no, I don't no. think he saw Predator 2. Predator. I don't think he even considered seeing Predator 2, but I would love if he did. That's more of a 90s That's a 90s, more of a 90s What was the one that Schwarzenegger was in? Predator. Wasn't was it Predator? Predator? Yeah. Get to the Apparently job, Prey uh, is good, one? the new Predator movie. Has anyone seen that? Yeah, he was in Predator, right? No, but like the new Predator? It looks good. No, I, okay. Yeah. It's on Netflix, or no, is it on Hulu? Wow. It's only on it's streaming. On it's on the internet. Yeah, it's, on it's on the internet. So, Empire Strikes Back comes out in 1980, and uh, many critics like it. Not all critics like it. Pauline Kael, somewhat famously, did not enjoy it. I promise I'm going somewhere with this. But um, uh, John Simon did not like this movie, and I'll read some of his quotes and see if you can get a flavor of what he thought of Star Wars. Strip Star Wars of its often striking images and its highfalutin scientific jargon, and you get a story, characters, and dialogue of overwhelming banality. Or this quote, oh dull new world, or this is how he ended his review of A New Hope, the, the, the episode four of Star Wars, which came out in 77, thank you. Star Wars will do very nicely for those lucky enough to be children or unlucky enough never to have grown up. I know, right? Thank you. Whoever, yeah, that's the right response. Oh, that's pretty bad. So uh, there's this kind of back and forth. Ebert and Siskel and Ebert obviously loved the movie, and there's this tension between them going back and forth, which culminates in this very, very strange debate on ABC Nightline, uh, which that like the weirdest part of the story is that this was put on television. But anyway, um, John Simon Wait, is like a, a movie review debate. Two, on three critics had a, a differing opinions on a movie, and that was enough to be news. Isn't yeah, that crazy? I feel like they're just scraping the bottom of the barrel Yeah, that's there, exactly. They? they didn't have Twitter, so they had to like find something, right? Yeah, I guess. Um, so uh, this this conflict uh, is put onto ABC Nightline, where, they're, where the, the, the group of three are able to debate this with one another, and John Simon gives this 
stinging rebuke of his fellow critics and of the, of the film generally. Uh, in talking about why Star Wars is bad, Star Wars as a series, I feel they're so bad because they're completely dehumanizing. Obviously, let's face it, they are for children or for childish adults. They're not for adult mentalities, which unfortunately means they're not for a lot of my fellow critics who also lack adult mentalities. The movies are stultifying children and making them dumber than they need to be, which is a very funny quote. Uh, these films try to keep children stupid, children forever, and that, I think, is wrong. All right, this is, uh, we're getting there. So, gentlemen, most important question, Empire Strikes Back, is it a good movie? Yes. Your I mean, hesitation it, it is, is a like good, No, it is a good movie. It what? is a good movie. But I'm, I'm trying to like work through the movie to see where his point is. Like, what's the stultifying thing that he's, what happen, that he's getting what, which, what happened in Empire? It's uh, uh, Yoda. It's been a while. Yeah. Oh, he's learning from Yoda. And learning from Yoda. That, he, that's the one that ends with the I, cliffhanger of Han Solo, Han Solo's right? frozen. Of, he's frozen carbonite. carbonite. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. No, it's, 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 worth, like, it's pretty fun. It, 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 it's like the. It's probably the best like sequel. It movie. starts in Canada. That one is it actually starting Canada? Well, it's uh, cool. The Frozen Tundra yeah. or whatever. Oh, Terminator Two is the best sequel movie. You are. Uh, I might give you that one, and also for the. I'm 80s. not wrong. Uh, you could be. I haven't seen it. I think in terms of importance of setting off an, a, a, a series, Empire Strikes Back is more important because Terminator. Terminator like five is already out. Or yeah, but they, it is. they're trash. Oh well, yeah, they're terrible. Yeah, but Last Jedi the, is perfect. Me, I don't know what you're talking the about. Rise of Skywalker. I don't want to talk good. about this. Okay, so Empire Strikes Back is a good movie. That's our uncontroversial opinion. Okay. Second, John Simon's attack on this movie is that it is childish. What does he mean by calling it childish? It's, it's like fun and campy. <laughs> he hates the good things about it. Yeah, it? right? <laughs> like that's why we love it is because it's silly and because there's Jabba and he's big and there's, there's a and tiny Yoda. green man who uses magical powers. Like, that's Return of the Jedi. Ja Jabba. The tiny green man? He's no, in the Yoda, Yoda's, Yoda's in it. Yeah. I think, is Jabba not? Jabba's in New Hope at least. Yeah, Jabba's already been there, right? Yeah. Um, I didn't prep you on having to talk about Star Wars today. We're always prepped to talk about Star Wars. No, but um, so what's like, I'm trying to think, is it just that it's like a simplistic story yes. or that it's just an adventure story, yes. a hero story? And he and thinks that that well, is like not and th expansive. And yes. I think the science is like, isn't the science kind of goofy? Like yes. lasers go on forever, dumb, dumb. They don't stop at swords. Like that kind of thing. He's not. He doesn't say that specifically, but yes, that kind of thing. That like the inco the science is not necessarily coherent, but w that most of what makes a new hope great. So the one before it, episode four, great is the technological advance. I promise we're going to move past Star Wars. Sorry, um, th is the technological advancement. Like if you've ever seen like original um, clips of a new hope, it looks like a terrible movie, but they happened to be making this when computer graphics were like coming on the scene. Right. So like it's that the thing that is good or attractive or interesting about the movie is a more like a sensory experience. It's, right. th it's the pretty things on the screen as opposed to a moving story of there's sacrifice in the first one, but you know, as opposed to some like deeper meaning, it's like pretty to look at and it's kind of loud. That is his criticism. Okay. Do you buy it? I don't know. I mean, it follows the, doesn't it follow the hero's journey? Like there's, it's the monomyth. Uh, that interpretation largely comes after the movie comes out, but yes, it's like a way of uh, yeah. I thought he bi I thought he read Hero with a Thousand Faces and Maybe. then he built it on that. Oh, that was my understanding. There's all kinds of stuff also where he like will point to Hidden Fortress by Kurosawa as this big influence, and it's like. Maybe he, I think he came up, I don't want to talk about George Lucas, sorry. Um, <laughs> this is not what I want to talk about. Um, I'm going to pin in it and then move on, sorry. But the, the point that he's getting to is that um, he is using this word childish in this negative connotation to write off the movie as not worth his time because it is for children. And Can you give me an example of a movie he favorably reviewed? Does he have one? <laughs> in this um, conversation, um, he talks about a movie he would rather take a child to. He didn't have children, but he would rather uh, take children. <laughs> as, you out. can probably tell from this uh, whole event. But uh, instead of Empire Strikes Back, he said he would, wanted to take his, uh, he would take a child to Tender Mercies. Does anyone know the movie Tender Mercies? Nope. I texted a friend of mine about this the other day. Let me read you the synopsis. Tender Mercies is a 1983 American drama film directed by Bruce Beresford. Um, it, the story follows Max Sledge, a recovering alcoholic country music singer who seeks to turn his life around through his relationship with a young widow. Not For exactly. Kids? Yeah, that, that's the point. Is like he clearly doesn't know what a children's movie is, <laughs> <laughs> or have any fun ever. Well, I think the more fun ever is kind of more the point I'm getting at with this. Of he's using this term childish. AJ, I th AJ and Graham, I think you're you're kind of pulling on these kind of separate threads there. Part of what he's saying is there's something fun here and enjoyable. And it's like curmudgeonly of him not to appreciate that. But maybe also there's something to what he's saying of like, at some point you probably move beyond childish things. Childish 
has a negative connotation and maybe should, maybe shouldn't. We'll get into that. Okay, so um, I, I open with this story both because all I want to do is talk about Star Wars, obviously, um, but also that um, that idea that I'm throwing out there of this connotation, this this negative association with a thing that is for children. Um, this is it, it's a very modern thing. Like the idea of there being a children's story that it is bad because it is for children would not have made sense 400 years ago for sure, 300 years ago it's a little iffy, and then 200 years ago is really where that comes from. Um, just, um, I, I didn't do any of my good introduction. I mentioned that um, uh, my wife is a former HR manager here. I also have two children. Uh, my oldest is three years old. Um, his name is Asher, he's wonderful. And my youngest is six months old. His name is Will. And um, I was very apprehensive going into being an adult of that a majority of what I would read would be books for children. That's, you know, I, I probably, you know, I, I was gonna guess how many pages I read, but I've read Cars and Trucks and Things That Go probably a hundred times over the last week. And it's like great every time I read it. Um, and just comparing some of the books I've read to my two children have been far more worth the time than some books that are quote unquote for adults. That um, there's like a joy that I get from reading Paddington Bear or I love um, the Pout Pout Fish. I don't know if you all read any of these, but like- The Pout Pout Fish? The Pout Pout Fish, I think it's this like deeply, uh, like <laughs> it's this like, it's, this, it's about the- Has he had a bad day? He has a bad life. He, like he is the pout pout fish until his like life is changed by this encounter with beauty. I think oh, so is he like the Eeyore of the sea? Yes, but I think it's a Dante story because it's like Beatrice comes down in the form of this like beautiful fish who like gives him one kiss and his life is changed. It's beautiful. Anyway, I love it. I you, promise you, it's good. You like Look, books about fish kissing? Yeah, I do. It's my favorite. It's my favorite genre. Uh, Shape of Water is my favorite movie. No, that's not. That's not a bad film. Oh, sorry. Okay, so that was a joke. Okay, so, um, but um, there are children's books that are better, that have more to them, more depth than either would appear at first blush or than many books that are targeted at adults. And that's more the, the point I'm getting at. Um, let me try another story and let's see if we can learn something about children's stories. How, how long does, this, does, this, this, does this session go? Is it till 12 or till 1210? Does anyone know? 12.05, I'll take it. I think you just took the average and you were just like, yeah, 12.05 sounds good. <laughs> I'm just gonna keep talking is the real problem. Here's my next story. Driven by hunger, a fox tried to reach some grapes, hanging high on the vine, but was unable to, although he leaped with all his strength. As he went away, the fox remarked, oh, you aren't even ripe yet. I don't need any sour grapes. People who speak disparagingly of things that they cannot attain would do well to apply the story to themselves. Sounds like a fable. It sounds like a fable indeed. Mm. Who do you think wrote that fable? Um, I mean, this is a total shot in the dark, but I'm guessing it's an Aesop's fable. It is an Aesop fable. <gasps> That's it two is, points. Though to be, uh, well, can I take it away because oh. Aesop didn't write any of these fables. What? Aesop lived like 200 years before the collection of <laughs> things that we call Aesop's fables. Uh -huh. There's a name for this. There's a law that things aren't named after the people who actually discover them. Uh, I don't remember that. There's a name for that, but. This is an example. Anyway, it is an Aesop fable. Aesop was a famous Greek storyteller. I think he was also a slave, but um, he himself did not write any of these stories down. He potentially told them, then they were spread all over and then collected eventually. Uh, I think he lived 600 BC in, we don't have any like written records till somewhere around 400. Regardless, Aesop's fable, that's one of them. Uh, what is the story about? Fox trying to get grapes. Fox. Yeah. It's pretty straightforward. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, and and we get a nice little message, mm -hmm. a conclusion a moral at, the end. at the end. Yes. So this is actually where sour grapes comes from. I'm sure you all know this, but this is the the origin of that phrase, sour grapes. So whenever you are saying the word sour grapes, you are referencing a well. Uh, I was going to say kid story, but maybe that's the question. Gentlemen, is this a children's story? I mean, based on how you were setting it up, I think we have to say no, right? Like it's a story for everybody. You, I mean, maybe is that what you think? Uh, I do. I mean, have you? I, I actually, but maybe about a year ago, read through all the Aesop's fables. Uh, have you ever read that with the, um, the G.K. Chesterton introduction to it? Oh, it's wonderful. No. Um, but anyway, but like they're these little moral stories. They, they. Um, I think Chesterton's point was that. Does he have a quote about dragons? I can't remember. In case, in that case, I have read it, and I'm about to quote yeah. it. Man, yes, reference it. But he's make, he's he's saying like when you have this fable, it is telling you that. The world is set up in a certain way yes. that is understandable. Yes, and that's probably has been considered children's stories because that's like 
a really comforting thing for a child or that children immediately react to it. Because uh, if you're a little kid, like, everything's weird. Um, yes. And you don't know, like, is it, is it, you have this thing called Christmas and you don't know when it's coming again. It's probably tomorrow. And, and like, you don't have this sort of these, these, these anchors for frames of reference for things. And so to have stories that say there is a nature to creatures or there's like a lion is like this, a fox is like this, people can be like this. That's a really, that children react really well to that. It's a really comforting thing. Which, um, and so this is sort of Chesterton's point is that like uh, these Aesop's fables are um, sort of little uh, like calcified examples of reality. Sure. Or that they are, uh, sometimes you'll hear it phrased that they are untrue stories that tell a true yeah, yeah. fact. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, there wasn't actually a fox, well maybe there's a fox that had thoughts about sour grapes, but the, the deeper point of things that people can't get, they curse. That's a deeper truth that is true regardless of the actual story being told. AJ, is this a children's story? Uh, yeah, a story understandable by children. Sure. Oh, that's interesting. Let's actually follow that. Um, so there's another story that was often told to um, communities of people. Uh, I'll ruin my, my example by telling you it's a Greek story that the, a, uh, a, a traveling singer named called a rhapsode, rhapsode, would, would go from, yes. rhapsode would go That's from it. town to town mm -hmm. to tell a story yeah. that was passed down by oral tradition for centuries and centuries, and it would be heard by the entire town, not just by adults or children. What story am I referencing? Are, uh, Iliad? Is that what you're talking Iliad about? Iliad and Odyssey. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they're both passed along that way. Can you comment on like how, so when we read the Odyssey now, it's a book, we're probably reading it by ourselves. Mm -hmm. How was it actually conveyed for it, centuries? It was sung. Yes, um, it was a, it was a song, and the whole community would gather. It was like uh, I mean, when you're a farming group and all you mostly worry about all day is grapes um, turning sour, like uh -huh. to make wine. That's actually the goal. Yes. Uh, then you know it's nice to have somebody like the it's, it was their entertainment, right? It was their version of a movie. Weird yes. guy comes, sings you a story, does it over a couple of nights. It's nice. And the movie example is interesting because. It's a movie that everyone was going to and everyone was, mm -hmm. in theory, enjoying. Enjoying to the degree that they passed it on to the next generation and the next and the next. Yeah, because it was also enculturation. Like, it told you many of the characters in the Iliad, like, some of them would have been from your hometown. Yes. So you're like, ah, oh, that's the guy from here. I know that guy. Oh, he died. Oh, yes. sad. <laughs> well, he wasn't a very good fighter. That makes sense. Yeah. So... But even, but even that example, I think, is further drawing out this thing that I think the Odyssey is a child story in the same way that Aesop's fables are a children's story, mm -hmm. that they are understandable by children. And there are maybe ways that you don't read them word for word from the Fagel's translation, because that might, my three-year-old would not stand for that. But there are ways where you can remember the story, retell it in a language that is relatable to a child, right? So that's kind of this first idea, is that... Um, the degree to which you'd consider something like Aesop's fables or even fables in general as a children's book or children's literature, um, it's to the same degree that like a classic that at Veritas they won't read until ninth grade is also for children, but it's not only for children. And I think that's the, the distinction between what we now call children's books and what historically would have been understood as children's literature. I'm doing all these air quotes that on our in the future podcast, no one will know that maybe you'll get it from my voice, but here we are. You do a little pause. I think it makes sense. I hope it does. They were children's literature. Yeah. yeah. That's, I promise, future listener, I'm doing it the right way. Um, the, the other thing I would point to the for Aesop's fables not only being for children is that is to look at how they've been used historically. And you can find works of art across the centuries that relate to and reference Aesop's fables, but aren't specifically for children. There's a beautiful set of doors in Italy, somewhere in Italy, from the 13th century that show two sets of stories related to the wolf. How do you like that for, that's a good, a good name. I feel like there's a lot of fables with that name. Yes, probably. Uh, right, like there's gotta be more than one just called the wolf. I, I will say this is the wolf and the crane and the wolf and the lamb, is that better? Okay, so probably not as many of those. Not as many yeah. of those. There's a 12th century pillar for the fox and the stork. There are sculpture and art and sermon illustrations. You can see that like when Adults are being preached to. Aesop's fables are being referenced. I wonder if fable writers just had like a couple of dice and a bunch of animals on each one, and they just rolled it, and then just fox and a horse. Let's do it. And then I do they would think write it that way. You probably get like, like co collections of traits that then become like the fox and the crane. Right? Yeah, that's got to be like a good way to do writing prompts. Is just shake roll the dice. dice and roll it, and then Don't you're you like these two animals, rock and roll. Don't you do rolling dice in class, or is that you, Graham? Yeah, yeah. but for different stuff. Different stuff. Yeah. No, but if you do go through the fables, like the fox has certain kinds of characteristics 
that pop up in all the different kinds of fables. So at the end, you can say like the fox is a type, a type. Yeah. And then the lion is a type. And uh, yeah, uh, the fox is clever. Yeah. And doesn't always tell the truth. Clever right? doesn't always tell the truth. Sometimes gets himself into trouble. Yeah. Sometimes he's he's successful. Sometimes he's he gets eaten. Um, but, but what's interesting with what you're saying is that at the like child level, like you know, five years and younger, it's just this is the fun story about the fox. Yeah. And then as you're growing up, it's oh, there's some similarities between these stories. Or and then, I know that guy. Exactly. And well, I, I was gonna say that's even the later yeah, one yeah. of it's not just about animals sharing traits, which is about just the characters. It's these are things that are true even outside of these silly little stories that I'm reading. And I think that is another part of this difference of a good children's story isn't isn't just an interesting or compelling story. It, it teaches you something true. Exa uh, something true and then something that can, like the, the, the reason why they're sort of the, the, the foundational building blocks for wisdom is there are traits of the fox that in a certain context pay out for the fox yep. positively, but those exact same traits in a completely different context are like to the ruin of the fox. And right. so it's not just be a fox and be successful. It's um, you need to sort of know when these, like the different contexts of when to apply these things, and that's that's why they're often sort of couched as wisdom literature, yes. because they're contextual yes. in, in being able to understand when and what, uh, when to do certain things. Like if you go back to AJ's talk this morning about prudence, right? Uh, teaching when is it prudent to be shrewd versus when is it prudent to be, you know, um, honest or whatever. Sure, I like that. And that's, and then it's to the credit of these stories that they have a level of understanding available to children that they can then grow into. It's not a weakness that they're understandable by children. It shows the depth of something, that there's an interesting plot, which is kind of a more shallow reading. There's an interesting logic, and then there's an interesting rhetoric, right? Just like how Asher, when he grows up and he reads Dante, uh -huh. when he reads it, he's going to, well, first of all, he's just going to think of them as fish. Because yeah, sure. <laughs> yes. Sorry, my apologies. <laughs> but, but I mean, he's going to, he's, he'll draw those connections, right? Yes. Because of that story, has the idea of, you know, uh, somebody's life being changed because of an, an encounter with beauty. Like, yes. that's going, those are tr true things more than, like, how funny are the little yellow things in the movie? Well, the minions. Oh, right? the minions. I was like, yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. Yes, yeah. he has not. My child has not seen a minion. Does that make him a better child? I don't okay. know. Maybe. Or does that make us good parents? We'll That's, find out. Okay. I guess. Is that a children's story that teaches a true thing? Oh no! Don't tell me. I don't know. I've the, seen the it. joy of childhood. Right? Who's seen this new minions movie? It's like a me mega hit. Right? Exactly. Is it? Is it good? It's good. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> they are awfully adorable. <laughs> they are indeed. Um, just one last point on this Aesop thing, and I'll move on. If by move on, I mean keep talking about Aesop. There's this thing called the, and I always mispronounce this, and AJ will correct me, progymnosmata, progymnosmata. Close enough. Okay, so there's this thing called the progymnosmata, and the progymnosmata, which I just want to repeat over and over until I get it right, is the series of rhetorical exercises, maybe this is an oversimplification, that oh. are meant to, to lead you into being a good rhetorician, a good speaker, by doing these different types of talks. And... Um, there were apparently lots of different orderings of what kinds of talks to give. We only have a few extant, still existing uh, manuscripts about how to order these talks. One of them is from a guy whose name I definitely can't pronounce. I'm not even going to try. But the f a traditional first speaking exercise is using a fable. It's, use, it's taking one of Aesop's fables as, he's, as the master of fables and then expounding on why this is a true thing that's being said. Um, and the progenus motto is normally for 12 to 15 year olds in, uh, I think this book comes from 300 BC. But anyway, this isn't just something for little kids. This is for a 12 to 15 year old who is then preparing themselves for adulthood, right? To become a rhetorician. So I said that was everything on Aesop. It's probably not. Um, so there are this, so then this division then between, uh, I'm using the term children's story to, re to refer to these older stories, and that, wouldn't, that distinction wouldn't have made sense. No one would have understood the Odyssey as a children's story, and even now, probably you wouldn't call it that. Um, and w rightfully so, wouldn't call it that. Um, but sometime around the 1800s is where this kind of division between children's literature and adult literature really comes into its own. Um, there are some quotes from John Locke favorably saying that he thinks that Aesop's stories should be included with pictures, turned into rhyming couplets, kind of made more appealing to children. And this comes to its, uh, you know, apotheosis in, uh, or it's like its peak in 1887. There's a, the first publication of The Baby's Own Aesop, which is just very funny. Um, but it's like an illustrated Aesop's fables that's very clearly targeted at children. And at that point, you've clearly said, these are for kids, these aren't for adults. 
Um, I'll take this from Tolkien. Tolkien on talking about why these fables, he calls them fairy stories. By fairy story, he means something with a fantastical element to it, some, some kind of magic in it. The reason that these become children's stories over time is that they fell out of favor. The association of children and fairy stories is an accident of our domestic history. Fairy stories have, in the modern lettered world, been relegated to the nursery as shabby or old-fashioned furniture is relegated to the playroom, primarily because the adults do not want it and do not mind if it is misused. It is not the choice of children which decides this. Children as a class, except in a common lack of experience, they, uh, they are not one. They're not a common group of people. Children as a class neither like fairy stories more nor understand them better than adults do and no more than they like many other things. So there's nothing inherent to the story itself that is for children. It's just that we adults got more rational and focused on intellect. And as a result, these stories about an enchanted world were no longer for adults. They were kind of thrown away and tossed to is, children. Is that your reading of it? Is that like the, um, this gap between child and adult was an enlightenment thing like as we got we just said as we got more rational we yeah. said oh these stories are silly yeah i mean we, i feel like we always just say the problem is the enlightenment <laughs> or rationalism or something you'll find some historian it's on the bingo card it is on the bingo Cosmo card stuff. does anyone have anyway. <laughs> yeah. um th there's a historian whose name i'll also butcher just for fun philippe aurier he um when we talked about a history of common life if or i think it's history of common life if you remember that he's the Ignore, just, I'm so sorry in advance for the sentence, but he's one of those French Annalis school guys, and um, he wrote a book saying that there was no such thing as childhood historically. That childhood was created in the 1800s as this distinction. Just think of the way that media was common across adult and child, and then um, it's kind of a, by, he, his argument is that it's a byproduct of as, um, as there's a market to sell to, you get more and more children's books to make money from selling to children, not for love of telling a certain kind of story. It's his argument, you can disagree with it. Um, there's a lot of stuff to disagree with him about. Okay, but take this of, um, we'll, we get our Aesop, baby Aesop in the late 1800s and it's kind of a straight line from this to what I just talked about of books written to children and only for children. Um, this, this, and I think this is where that negative association then comes from of a thing that is for children is childish in that children's books now aren't written for adults to enjoy them or read them. Um, th this leads uh, to a great article from C.S. Lewis on the three types, I have the name somewhere, uh, on three ways of writing for children. Um, Lewis says, I am almost inclined to set it up as a canon that a children's story which is enjoyed only by children is a bad children's story. He'll say elsewhere in the piece that essentially that's the you can, those are only or th those are primarily modern stories because the older stories don't draw this distinction between children and adults. Um, and then this is where you then get to John Simon saying Star Wars is bad because it's for children. I guess what I'm trying to say is he, it's almost ad hominem, ad hominem is not the right word, but he's almost attacking the wrong part of the movie. Is what I'm like for a thing to be appealing to children is not to its discredit, is most of the argument I'm yeah. trying to get Because to. kids like it, therefore adults shouldn't. It, that, yeah, that's, that is the argument, yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I think that's the, you, you know, I think John Simon has a lot of good stuff to say, that's why I have his collected um, reviews, but I think that argument is directing, is directed at the wrong place. A thing that children enjoy, I think can often be to its credit. That my child likes Peter Rabbit and Beatrix Potter is to its credit because Beatrix Potter has these like fascinating social dynamics in the story that Asher's not interested in, but I see them as I read them. I mean, there's also, I mean, the classic example of Narnia. Yes, right? great example. Which is a children's story, but right. I, I would still read. And I think uh, Harry Potter would also probably slot in here. And the, its, its success is probably due to it being appealing both to children and to adults. Sure. Um, and that whole argument, like, if kids like it, therefore not for adults, well, kids like ice cream too. And Therefore, also is bad. <laughs> happen to like you know water yeah, sure. and yeah, sure. food yeah. and sleep and like all of these things like it feels like an argument argument that falls apart real fast. It does. There's something to it where like um, eating sweets all day a child would also like, but that is an excess of some kind as opposed to some ice cream is okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I think I think there is making the same mistake like a children's story that 
stinks. A kid shouldn't like that yes, either. That's and the should point. Should grow. Yes, right. Exactly. Yes. Which is why Harry Potter, a whole different thing. Well, yeah. <laughs> but I think Lewis. Anyway, I would say Narnia is a better example of it because there is yeah. a depth of of meaning to it as opposed to I think much of Harry Potter is a nostalgia. Am I? Uh, anyway, I think that's uh, anyway, that's a whole thing we don't. That's want a whole to get different into. thing. Yeah. yeah but there, I mean. Just because a child likes it doesn't mean it's that's, or, that, that it's a good thing. Yes. Like kids love those algorithmically generated YouTube crazy. Have y'all videos. seen these? It's crazy. These are insane. Yeah. Um, Algo- wait, algorithmically they're, they're, they're generated just, YouTube. Videos? So what they'll do is they'll like pull random characters. So it'll be like Elsa from Frozen and Spider Man and like the Hulk and, and the Hulk, and they'll be like, like dancing Pikachu. randomly. And it's like even their their movement is just like a random stochastic very vari- like you just pick random movements that they're making random songs random dances and it's just hour-long videos of that it's crazy it sounds fantastic no one's making no, it it's no, just no, someone no, created an no, hour no <laughs> put it on youtube and like kids are watching it and it's, it's insane. i feel like i could rock and roll for like 30 seconds yeah. with that <laughs> Maybe, and then i'd yes. be really okay but really my point being that there needs there's uh, there, is, there is something like there is a difference between a beatrix potter or an aesop fable and those those videos yep. even though the kid may like both of them totally agree and maybe that piece of it is the, uh, I mean, of course, we're a podcast called Classical Stuff, so there's something to the age of something that it's been passed on that's some indication of its value. That's chronological snobbery, probably. I don't know. No, that, that's a legitimate. Yeah, yeah, piece. snob it up. Okay. Um, but um, so it's that, re- maybe it's a requirement of approval on both sides of, like, uh, we just, we were cleaning through our, our kids' books recently, and um, so I, you know, I walk into the house and I see Sarah with like all these children's books around her, and I'm like, what, you know, what is this? And so she's dividing them into these different categories, and so she has the, um, the, the, the big pile of Asher likes this book and I like this book. Okay. But then she has this other pile, also pretty large, of Asher loves this book, I hate this book, and we had to get like you have to get rid of those because that means it's a, the taste of my wife I trust. Like that's a bad pile of books that needs to be gotten rid of. But the it's not only a does Asher like it or does he not like it, and it's not only does Sarah like it, does Sarah not like it. It's this kind of union of the two, where you're then building to quality and pointing to quality. So I think it's the two together. Um, I'm I have a few kind of practicalish things, and then we'll wrap up here. Um, so uh, the 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 first and most obvious is um, just go out and read a, a, a story that you might consider a quote-unquote children's story. I went to Stout House this morning to finish up my preparation, and I brought Beatrix Potter, and gosh darn it, I read Beatrix Potter in Stout House this morning. It was great, and I loved it, and people looked at me like I was a weirdo, and I'm okay with that. And there's all kinds of good stories, like there's, uh, didn't Oscar Wilde do a series of fables? Maybe, I don't know. I think he did. I read like one of them, it was good. But Beatrix Potter is great. Um, Aesop's fables, I think, are especially interesting because they have, there's room to ponder them, and um, as you read them, you, there's that depth of learning these archetypes as you go. But pick up a story that you might consider childish, but that is good, or that uh, you believe to be good, or that is, again, old. That's always my... The great one is The Light Princess. Hmm? Oh, that, you know the Light Princess? That was um, McDonald, right? Yeah, George McDonald. George McDonald. Check it out. It's, it's a great story. So the, the break probably comes... Just I'm just reflecting back to where yep. we were like five minutes ago talking about when, when do these things start being for kids... And it, it, it's probably coming up when we started sort of psycho- psychologizing everything. When Maybe. we sort of the, the growth of Freud or the idea that like the childhood development is this, you know, critical time that is a completely alien and foreign thing to being an adult. Therefore, we need to create material that can mold and shape this you know, foreign creature, which is a child, which is not the same thing as an adult, right? Yes. And um, foreign creature is a great name for a child. No, but I, I, but I think it applies better to like seventh, eighth grade. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's like, and I, I know that uh, Josh Gibbs has made this argument before on his blog and on his podcast that the, well, one of the sins of sort of modern children's stories is that they are trying to manage children a lot more sure. than creating something that isn't enjoyable for everybody. So right. you're trying to, you, yes, Aesop's Fable has a moral, but it's a moral that is as applicable to, to, I mean, to us as it is to a kid, whereas like the modern story of... Brush your teeth. Yeah, or That's everybody praising yeah. the child who lost their tooth, and the right. child walks around New York City, and like the butcher's like, amazing, you lost your tooth. And then like the child learns, everybody in the world cares about me. Uh, right, and I'm the everybody. most important thing ever. Right. Or like everybody the, poops. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or these these sorts of um, yeah, those sorts of silly things. So there's there's um, I'm not enough versed enough on I don't have children, so I'm not versed enough on like modern kids books. But it seems like it's 
a weird battlefield almost. Yes, yeah, I would agree with that description of it. Let me, um, I'll, I'll go through the next two real quick. Obviously, if the first one is to go and read a children's story yourself, number two is go find a kid and read that story to them. Either, you're, we have, I think roughly half the room has grammar school kids, go read them a book, um, or, you know, go volunteer with your church's kids ministry. They would love you forever if you did that. Um, and, uh, and enjoy that book alongside them. Find the parts that you enjoy and, and just comment that how much you're enjoying the book. I, we made reference before to G.K. Chesterton. Maybe this is from that same introduction, Graham, that you, you referenced. Um, Chesterton says, fairy tales do not tell children that dragons exist. Children already know that dragons exist. Fairy tales tell children the dragons can be killed. And so, whereas the... And oh, that's, that's good. Isn't that good? This yeah. Chesterton guy, he's got some good quotes. Um, so the, there's a part of it where there's a good thing to pass on to the kids. That's kind of the second point. Read it to a kid. They have something to gain from it. But I, I think the reverse of it is true of to that first point of reading a, a children's story on your own. Maybe we need to be reminded that there are dragons in this world, that there, um, that, there, that we live in an, an enchanted world, that there is magic and mystery all about. Uh, and then finally, um, I... I don't want to read the whole quote. Lewis has this thing about people who are, I'll just read it, it's actually a good quote, sorry. Um, that if you're nervous about any of this and that if reading a kid's book in Stout House makes you think I'm a weirdo, which I am, um, then I just would offer this to you from Lewis from that same one about three ways to write a kid's story or whatever it's called. Critics who treat adult as a term of approval instead of as merely a descriptive term cannot be adults themselves. To be concerned about being grown up, to admire the grown up because it is grown up, to blush at the suspicion of being childish, these things are the marks of childhood and adolescence. And in childhood and adolescence, they are in moderation healthy symptoms. Young things ought to want to grow, but to carry on into middle life or even into early manhood, this concern about being adult is a mark of really arrested development. When I was 10, I read fairy tales in secret and would have been ashamed if I had been found doing so. Now that I am 50, I read them openly. When I became a man, I put away childish things, including the fear of childishness and the desire to be very grown up. Isn't that good? This Lewis guy. Jeez, okay. Um, and just all that to take it back to, uh, to Simon. When Simon insulted the um, adult, what did he call it? The adult mentalities of uh, Siskel and Ebert, Ebert shot back, I wouldn't say I'm childlike, but Simon is old at heart. Siskel added on, I feel badly that John Simon didn't have a good time at the picture, and I think that's the only response we can have to someone who doesn't enjoy what is truly a good story. And Ooh, that is got him. We got him. Yeah, okay. got him good. And that's everything from us. We're two minutes over. I apologize. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.